two, one. Good afternoon. I'm Joanne Conroy, President and CEO of Dartmouth Hitchcock, Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, here for our Facebook Live with Dr. Maria Padin, who is the Chief Medical Officer for the Southern Region and our community practice. Now, I know a lot of you probably know the drill, but please submit questions on the uh, news feed part of Facebook Live, and we have people here in our studio that are collecting the questions and they'll actually deliver them to me so I can integrate your questions into our conversation with Dr. Padin this afternoon. So um, welcome and let's talk about a few questions first mm -hmm. before we get rolling that came from our previous viewers. There are a couple things I want to address. Some viewers have said, why aren't you wearing masks? Well, um, our policy is for all staff to wear some level of PPE at work, but we are in a closed work office here. We have all been screened upon entry, and we are sitting more than six feet away from each other. And in those circumstances, it, um, when necessary, it is okay to not wear a mask. Now, I have another personal reason is my mom sometimes watches these Facebook Live and she's like totally hard of hearing and she reads my lips all the time. So that becomes far more difficult when you're using a mask, believe me, I know. Um, <clears throat> another thing though I want to talk about before we actually talk about Maria's career and some of the priorities she has in her new role um, in the southern part of the state is kind of the national scene mm -hmm. and social unrest. I think you have to be living under a rock to not appreciate what's been going on across the country over um, the last really four or five days. Um, really, um, you know, more of a painful kind of um, demand to be heard mm -hmm. about social and racial injustice. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think any of us are surprised that on top of a pandemic mm -hmm. that's required people to isolate, um, questions about employment and a number of people being out of work, and then on top of this, the really disturbing videos that, um, that have been shared broadly in social media about the death of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess, None of us are surprised at um, how people have reacted. Mm -hmm. they, I think the one aspect of this is that, you know, we still have racism in the United States. Mm -hmm. And as a Caucasian person, you just don't appreciate that. You don't expect to be judged by the color of your skin or arrested um, because of the color of your skin. But that happens every day to people that mm -hmm. um, are not white. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Maria, you know, what, what's your opinion? Mm -hmm. Because you come from a multi-ethnic family. Mm -hmm. um, what's your opinion of kind of how we should approach this? Yeah, I mean, I think this has been a very disturbing time, I think, in the face of a pandemic to recognize the turmoil that this country is in. Um, you know, as a Latina um, with biracial children and grandchildren and family members who have um, different color skin, um, it's, it's very hard to recognize that the legacy of slavery and discrimination is so alive still in this country um, every day. You know, it, it's heartbreaking for me as a parent and grandmother to think about the fact that the um, color of my children's skin and or my grandchildren really um, means that their experience every day in this country is very different. Um, and, and I think when we stand in moments like this that are so hurtful, um, that can instill such anger, I think we have to funnel that energy and say, how can we help fix this? How can we, in our own space, contribute to changing the discussion, to changing these biases? Um, and I think we do it very deliberately. You know, as a healthcare provider, um, 
I think about the fact that even in the healthcare system as a child in New York City, um, our family faced many times some of these remarks, some of the sometimes unspoken attitudes that said, you're different. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to actually work every day to create an environment of equity, equality, diversity, and inclusiveness and when we render care. And I think if there is a place where we can rally around that, it's really in a healthcare system. Because every day, think about what we have done during this COVID uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. People from diverse groups have really gotten together. We have people from different religions, genders, sexual preferences who work in healthcare, mm -hmm. who every day are united by a common goal. Mm -hmm. And that common goal is caring for others. If we can translate that uh, to our regular, to our environment outside of healthcare, that's the role we can play. And it might be different, but we should all be asking ourselves, how can we contribute in a positive way to changing, to reforming, um, and to creating an experience that's based on humanity and not on color? Yeah, that's a good, really a good thought. You know, how do we translate the humanity in healthcare? to the humanity as citizens mm -hmm. of one United States. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I would say that we still have some tough times ahead of us. Mm -hmm. um, it appears that in most cities, a lot of the protests have actually become more peaceful, mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't fix things mm -hmm. that actually cause the problem, mm -hmm. and that's work ahead of us. That's, you're correct. So, but we're here to talk to you about your role. Take a, tell us a little bit about your background. So I am, um, I think I probably would say I grew up like many other um, Latinas, you know, in a little bit of what we call the Puerto Rican diaspora, coming to and traveling back and forth from uh, Puerto Rico and, uh, and New York City, which is where I lived growing up. And, um, and I think there was always in our family a sense of service to others. Um, I am one of, um, uh, well, if you think about the way extended families live in, in communities, I am one of uh, six um, children, one which is actually a cousin that was raised with us, um, and most all of us have entered healthcare in one way mm -hmm. or another. Um, and uh, I always knew I wanted to do healthcare, I just didn't know what kind of healthcare I wanted to do, but several mm -hmm. um, into my career, I started off as a language and literature major and then decided I wanted to be a physician, mm -hmm. so did my pre-med. Um, and then I came to Dartmouth, um, and I came to Dartmouth for many things, thinking I would only be here for my medical school, and now 32 years later, here I am still, um, uh, for a number of reasons. One, um, it, it was a great institution. Um, I felt it also um, would provide me with a very unique um, medical school experience. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, you know, I came to med school as a single mother with uh, two small children, and living in the Upper Valley really seemed like also a very kind of safe environment when you're extremely busy and consumed with your medical school curriculum to be able to have and balance family. Mm -hmm. I am just trying to imagine going to medical school with two small children. You know, I think it's one of those <laughs> things you get through it in life and you just don't think about it. You just sometimes have to do. And then in retrospect, you go like, wow, you know, how'd I do that? But um, I think anything is possible if you set your mind to it. So you decided to go into OBGYN, mm -hmm. and you did your residency up here as well? I did my residency at Maine Medical, ah. um, and then following my Another residency. Another one of my favorite places. Yes, that's exactly right. Here I was going to go back to a warm place. I quite did not ever accomplish that. Um, and once I was done, I came back to Dartmouth and actually worked in the community group practices mm -hmm. um, for 18 years um, as a uh, obstetrician gynecologist and through my time there assumed multiple roles of leadership with the organization. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, you're really a Geisel Medical School recruitment success story. <laughs> um, I think I'll, uh, we tried to recruit many of the medical students to stay, but Geisel actually draws students from across the country, and many mm -hmm. return to their homes in California and um, the southwestern part of the state. So um, it really speaks to the fact that they recruited the right person when they recruited you to Geisel. Well, well, thank, well thank you. 
<clears throat> now let's talk about your new role. Mm -hmm. So you took a role as the chief medical officer for the Southern Region and Community Practice, which really is oversight over a big book of our business, which mm -hmm. is Nashua, Concord, and Manchester, after having served as the chief medical officer here. You started your role just two weeks before we stood up incident command, mm -hmm. I believe. So what was that like? So, you know, there's nothing like being, um, like starting a new job in the midst of a pandemic. Um, I think it really sort of accelerated the process of the interface um, and of my role because I, incident, I was immediately launched into um, our incident command or emergency services coordination for the community group practices working in coordination with um, incident command for the whole health system. Um, you know, there was, we had this whole onboarding plan that we were supposed to do. I was supposed to tour all of the sites, do the meet and greets and and certainly we had to put all of that on hold. You know, fortunately, because I had worked in the community group practices for 18 years and had held leadership roles there, I was familiar with the landscape. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we found ourselves immediately having to really work with our um, hospitals in, uh, in the communities we serve um, because we really had to work with them to coordinate um, how we would all prepare for surge together and mm -hmm. how we would collaborate with each other to um, help care for the patients and keep our staff safe and our patients safe. So immediately, you know, part of the work we all had to work uh, collaboratively together was around um, uh, surgical scheduling mm -hmm. uh, and, and really um, canceling several cases in order to allow us to prepare ourselves for not only the PPE but the potential surge. Mm -hmm. And so that required a lot of coordination um, but it also a lot of interface and interaction with our, our, our the communities we serve, you yeah. know, even beyond just the hospitals. So there are a number of facilities that we admit patients to, and any given day we probably have 175 or 200 Correct. people in beds mm -hmm. in hospitals that are not Dartmouth-Hitchcock hospitals. That includes Concord, CMC, Elliott, mm -hmm. Southern New Hampshire, and even, I think we even have some patients in St. Joe's. Mm -hmm. So how do you actually coordinate with the incident command teams from across five organizations? So a, a lot of times we created connections really with their leadership mm -hmm. um, and we began to share data with each other. Um, some of that data was also coordinated through the hospital association in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. um, they were, we were all very willing to share where we each found ourselves because we knew we had to potentially, that we depended on each other as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for us from a community perspective, one of the things we recognized was how could we assist the hospitals in decanting their EDs, mm -hmm. for example, if they faced a surge. Mm -hmm. And so we set up respiratory clinics in mm -hmm. our community group practices um, to be able to assess and care for patients who still might have some COVID-related issues that did not require really an emergency room evaluation, mm -hmm. but some supportive care. Mm -hmm. um, so that was part of the work we did, thinking about how we could also be of service to them. Um, you know, additionally, we talked about our staff and our clinicians that we share and that actually practice in a multitude of their institutions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it also became aligning with what the practices are at each site. So, mm -hmm. you know, as we're now in recovery, one of the things that we have worked to help coordinate is the preoperative testing mm -hmm. that many of the hospitals are requesting um, as they, again, begin to book very necessary um, surgical cases that were delayed mm -hmm. as everyone was preparing to sort of operate in this sort of new world we find ourselves in. Yeah. I know that we had a series of kind of conversations about testing versus no testing for COVID-9 before procedures, but I think that most of the facilities, and correct me if I'm wrong, have decided that before a surgical procedure mm -hmm. or anything that would really require an airway manipulation that people get tested ahead of time, mm -hmm. even though a test 48 hours ahead of time is not an absolute guarantee that mm -hmm. when 48 hours later when you're admitted that you don't have COVID-19. Mm -hmm. However, um, it does eliminate mm -hmm. um, any person that maybe is actively ill. Um, 
you know, what, what is your thoughts on how easy or difficult that is to coordinate, how willing people are to be tested? Is there some fear from patients in the community that they don't want to know? Or are they eager to be tested? Um, what's the sentiment of the patients? You know, my sense is that most patients understand that testing is recommended. So one of the things that we did in the community group practices was stand up testing sites at each of our Con in Concord, Manchester, and Nashua. Mm -hmm. We're seeing approximately between three to 500 tests being performed per week. Mm -hmm. um, one of the interesting things is that even with that degree of testing that we're doing, only about 5% are coming back as COVID positive. Yeah. So the preponderance of the people who are experiencing illness um, that they might think is, are, are related to COVID are not COVID yeah. and are really other things that they should be seeking care for. We have not had any um, significant um, sort of patient pushback with regards to uh, preoperative testing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the challenges with preoperative testing, it's not just about the testing, it's what do you do while you're awaiting the results, which many institutions have recommended that as you're awaiting your procedure, after you get tested, you do self-quarantine yeah. in order to limit potentially an exposure um, mm -hmm. during that interval of time before your actual procedure. And I think we've been able to work collaboratively with all of the different institutions and with the help of our clinicians and our staff to really um, have a pretty smooth process mm -hmm. um, for that to be accomplished. So the testing that we're currently doing at I, when I went down to Nashua, I saw their setup. It was drive-through testing. Are you still doing drive-through testing for patients for their COVID-19 tests preoperatively in the South? Um, yes, we, we are. And we're still doing it through our testing tents. Um, so we're still following similar process. The other thing, I think we've really worked very hard to make sure that we are uh, making our clinics as safe as they can be. Mm -hmm for our staff and for our patients. Mm -hmm. And so um, in addition to keeping the testing outside of the clinic, mm -hmm. also in that also helps us preserve PPE because yeah. we have designated teams who are doing that testing. Yeah. Um, we're also keeping patients who are maybe suspect for COVID um, outside of our of the inside of our clinic environment, right? Though when you walk into our clinic, even if someone walked in with COVID, I think we've taken certain measures to really make sure that we are keeping everyone safe. So you will find that if you're calling for an appointment, you will be um, probably get some screening questions. Mm -hmm. And the reason we're screening is so that we can make sure that we are directing you to the most appropriate site mm -hmm. for you to receive the care you need. Yes, um, we go left to the urgent care yeah. where we're assessing everybody right. that has COVID symptoms, or you go right, That's which will right. take you up to the um, clinic area. That's exactly right. So not only are you being screened when you're making the appointment, but then when you show up for your appointment, you will be screened again and have mm -hmm. a temperature check at the door. Mm -hmm. um, we are require, requiring that all patients and staff mask. Mm -hmm. So if a patient has not brought their own mask, we will provide them with a mask. Mm -hmm. We also have staggered the appointments so that we can abide by the principles of social distancing. Mm -hmm. um, and in some instances where we might have um, waiting areas that are a little more constricted, mm -hmm. we're having patients wait in their car and then be called immediately to either the exam room and or the procedure area. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's important um, that patients understand that we have taken every measure to make sure that we are creating the most safest environment. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of you know, tell my kids that they're actually safer probably coming into a clinic or even to the hospital now with the precautions and the, I think, situational awareness yeah. that we have than in other places where you might let your guard down a little yeah. bit. I think we've just started to circulate some videos on social media that actually show patients what it's like. And once people get in the facility, Jonathan Thing in Nashua said, mm -hmm. you know, they actually feel really comfortable because we're taking a lot of precautions and there's universal masking and they get um, checked several times before they actually get into the clinic. So um, once we get them in there, they have a much higher level of mm -hmm. comfort with it. Now, I do want to remind anybody that's watching that has a question to go ahead and put your question on the news feed um, component of Facebook. So our team will pick it up here and deliver the question um, to us so we can answer it. 
So um, there are a few other questions here. Um, you really moving very quickly through this, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk about pregnant women, because mm -hmm. you're an OBGYN provider, and I remember that you were pulled in um, very um, early on in our conversations about COVID-19 and the impact on patients to really talk about um, the impact on the pregnant patient. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's interesting, that's when people feel um, not only a personal risk, but certainly responsible for their unborn child and mm -hmm. trying to protect them. So um, what do you tell a pregnant woman about the risk to her and her baby and how we're gonna try to help them have the best possible experience through pregnancy and delivery, but keep everybody safe? Yeah, so, you know, I think as it relates to our um, pregnant um, women, um, you know, I think the first thing I have to tell patients is that we just don't know, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's important to, um, for people to recognize that we don't have enough data mm -hmm. um, to really understand what the um, implications might be of COVID mm -hmm. um, for um, pregnant women and their unborn um, mm -hmm. babies. We don't have enough information with regards to um, if there's any potential vertical transmission, meaning transmission to the fetus mm -hmm. of a mother who might um, acquire COVID mm -hmm. um, in, in utero. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I tell patients is that what we, what we do know um, and what we can, from a clinical perspective, say is that Probably there, what we're, what our limited experience has been is that their risk is probably similar mm -hmm. to the risk of any other patient mm -hmm. um, who has maybe some comorbidities, and mm -hmm. so they should be um, washing their hands frequently. Mm -hmm. They should be practicing the principles of social distancing. Mm -hmm. They should be wearing um, face masks when they're in public or places. Mm -hmm. um, where they might be around um, more individuals than their mm -hmm. immediate family. And they should be um, really also avoiding any area where there's a large gathering. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, those are the key pieces. Um, yeah. uh, you know, and I, and I think we have um, urged um, many locations um, to really begin to think about creating a data um, uh, center um, with regards to this population. You know, mm -hmm. I, there are a lot of studies that are um, emerging around COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I think as an obstetrician gynecologist, our sort of advocacy piece has been to not exclude pregnant women yeah. in the research so that we can understand um, what the implications are. If there's a vaccine being developed, for example, we should not be excluding pregnant women yeah. from being participants in that. Um, because again, right, um, we have to think about the fact that there are some differences that might be um, um, sort of tackled and or addressed by having that bigger inclusiveness of those groups. I think the other issue that I think as um, an obstetrician gynecologist, and it I think also speaks to the opening comments that we had in our conversation are, you know, we know that there have been some disparities in mm -hmm. maternal outcomes associated with um, uh, race, ethnicity mm -hmm. in this country. Um, and I think more than ever, we're still seeing this now, yeah. even beyond um, pregnant women and the number of individuals from, um, you know, our minority populations that have been impacted by the COVID uh, yeah. pandemic. Um, and so, again, I think that it creates a heightened awareness of mm -hmm. us to really look at um, the inclusiveness not only of research uh, moving forward around COVID of all of these populations, yeah. um, but also understanding how we can also provide reassurance and be attuned to other components of our, pre our patients' backgrounds mm -hmm. and or situation um, that may also impact their vulnerability yeah. um, to this disease. Yeah. I know early on in the pandemic, it was interesting, we had a lot of pregnant women from 
metropolitan areas mm -hmm. um, south of us, mm -hmm. both from certainly New York City and maybe even some from Boston that chose to deliver up here. Mm -hmm. that is a, that's super difficult for yeah. an obstetrician who has not developed a relationship with a patient or has been involved in their medical um, and obstetrical mm -hmm. um, history to um, you know, assume care at the last minute. Mm -hmm. How did you approach that? So I think as an organization and individually as obstetricians, we recognize that not only is it difficult for us when we don't know a patient's history, but think about the burden for these patients, right? Mm -hmm. They were so fearful of the environment that they would be delivering in. Um, you know, there were also visitation restrictions that mm -hmm. were placed in many of the hospitals that were really facing, you know, significant surge yeah. um, where patients were delivering. And so to find yourself um, in an environment where y you have all of this anticipation over months and you're counting on a support system yeah. and all of a sudden to find yourself not maybe having that support system really moved a lot of patients to think about where can I deliver where that's still possible. Yeah. I think our staff really created a process here mm -hmm. with the help of our perinatology group to actually screen and assess these patients. Mm -hmm. um, we talked and did um, testing um, for these patients, mostly because they were coming from a potentially high risk, high surge area. Mm -hmm. And we had to think about what were the implications after birth for the neonate, mm -hmm. right? Um, because we do know in many organizations that we, and even from a ACOG perspective, that women who are closer to delivery, maybe up to 14 days before, should be really thinking about trying to really limit their exposure. Mm -hmm. um, because if they are under COVID suspect, while their testing is being awaited, that might have an implication to their ability to maintain or be with their baby mm -hmm. at the time of delivery. Right. So we um, took appropriate steps to be able to navigate that. Yeah. Um, and, um, and we instituted earlier testing. Um, you know, deliveries are a little different because you are with those patients for a longer period of time, mm -hmm. um, particularly during their second stage. So we also had to think about the implications of safety mm -hmm. for our staff yeah. and how we would provide um, personal protective equipment for our staffs who might be with a COVID positive patients in yeah. a prolonged encounter for multiple hours. Yeah. Um, because we wanted to not be, not eliminate the support that we still had to provide these women during what can be a very joyful, but also a very scary period That's in their right. lives. That's right. Um, so my expectation is when we saw a surge, but we're probably not seeing as many mm -hmm. of those patients now that they probably mm -hmm. relaxed a lot of the visitor restrictions in New York and Boston. And also the, um, the number of cases appears to be actually decreasing in both those areas. Yeah. So a very strange time. Mm -hmm. um, to be delivering um, obstetric care during mm -hmm. early days of the pandemic. Um, what do you see over the next six to 12 months, um, the future of healthcare, not just at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, but across the country? You know, there have been a lot of things that have changed around mm -hmm. COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, telehealth, et cetera. So if you have a crystal ball, what what do you see in the future, specifically how it may impact ambulatory care, which is our big commitment in the southern part of the state? Yeah, I think, you know, I think that we will be delivering care differently. I think that there are a couple of things that have been accelerated. I'm, I'm actually impressed at the flexibility to move quickly and to change so quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, in healthcare, we have not always been um, very fast. Sort of very fast. Yeah. Um, but this has actually, um, moved us in ways that we never anticipated we would be moved into. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that we will be delivering a greater preponderance of care when appropriate mm -hmm. through telehealth. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things where you still need to see the patient, but I think we've learned that there are some things that can be more convenient, more patient friendly, mm -hmm. um, and that there is a continued chance for innovation mm -hmm. around telehealth delivery, particularly for urgent type of appointments mm -hmm. for our patients. Um, I think that the other thing that we um, have um, learned is the resiliency of our healthcare teams. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that we're going to have to be very mindful of the fact that 
we've required so much change from so many people that probably our need for providing um, greater mental health access for our health care providers and our staff will be um, really important mm -hmm. and part of our regular business. I think we're going to have to think too about those lessons we have learned in terms of how COVID has impacted different populations mm -hmm. and that we're going to have to think about that interface that we play with public health mm -hmm. but also with our communities in terms of the social determinants um, and the impact that they have on disease and on health. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are going to be things that are going to be prominent in our agendas as we move forward and think about um, how we restructure the delivery of health care. You know, I also think that many organizations have found themselves in a very unusual situation. Um, when did we ever foresee that during a pandemic we would see the amount of furloughs mm -hmm. and or the impact to employment in the healthcare industry that we have seen. Yeah. Um, and I think that there is, um, particularly when many of us were facing workforce shortages right. before this. So I think we're really gonna have to think about what does this mean for people who may have been contemplating also a healthcare career, mm -hmm. right? Um, how do we um, recognize that at some point that demand is still there and that we still need to care for our communities, we still need to provide um, health um, uh, care and health programs. Yeah. Um, and so I think that these are all things that we will have to be very deliberate mm -hmm. in addressing for health care as we move forward. Yeah, we used to comment that New Hampshire was almost a zero unemployment state. You know, we had such low levels mm -hmm. of unemployment and yet it feels like it will be climbing. It will return to its pre-COVID state at some point, but we will have a period of time where um, we still need to encourage people to go into healthcare mm -hmm. and we still need to make sure we fill up our pipeline, mm -hmm. but it will be delivering care in a very different way, probably Correct. a lot in the home, mm -hmm. a lot um, really outside of the traditional bricks and mortar mm -hmm. setting that we've established. Now, let's talk about post-COVID. Pandemic is over, we have a vaccine. What are the things that you wanna focus on in the southern part of the state? So I think we really wanna focus on um, how do we continue to decrease variation in care delivery? How do we continue as an organization to focus on the total cost of care for our patients? Um, how do we deliver care that really has value and is impactful to people's lives? And sometimes it's not just about care, but how do we address the things that keep people healthy mm -hmm. in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, I think those are things that we will need to continuously um, address. And I think we're going to have to also make an assessment of where will people be mm -hmm. um, post-COVID, mm -hmm. you know, psychologically as a society. I think that we... Um, have discovered and learned a lot about ourselves mm -hmm. and our families um, as we've been sort of not forced but placed in a scenario where we've had to spend more time together and I think priorities are going to change mm -hmm. for our communities and our families as well. Um, you know I think that you know I come from a culture where you try to always look at the silver lining mm -hmm. in the worst scenarios mm -hmm. um, and this has certainly been a very difficult uh, situation for our country, for our communities, for people, um, the financial implications, the health implications, the fear. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that in many cases it has also brought a lot of people together and families together in a way that they never imagined. Mm -hmm. um, it has created probably more family dinner times mm -hmm. um, than people ever thought they would have. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, I think we will see a shifting maybe of priorities. I'm yeah. hopeful for that. Um, you know, it's kind of brought people again back to sort of a little bit of that nuclear family concept because that's become your safe place. People's and lives are a little bit simpler. That's not right. Not as much travel and not yeah. as many dinner yeah. out. Yeah. Um, a lot more home time. That's right. And. Um, I think some people actually appreciate that. Yeah. And I think the implications to our environment 
too. You know, I think that those have been some places are talking about being able to now see, you know, depending on where you are in the country, the, some of the smog has lifted. Yes. And you can see mountain peaks that you didn't see before. It'll be interesting to see what kind of implication that also has to other health care issues that we many times face associated with what we do to our own yeah. environment. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, thanks, Maria. It's just been a pleasure to interview you. And thank you to our audience. Thank you. For spending time with us on Facebook Live. Have a great day.